In modern air combat, it's possible to reach out to a target with a long-range missile well beyond visual range. But there isn't a magic system that knows the identity and intentions of every single airborne object in a war zone. So how can a fighter pilot be certain that a missile was launched against an armed hostile and not a civilian airliner? We'll answer that question in this video. The U.S. Air Force has three ways of identifying the affiliation of any aircraft. It can be visually identified by someone close enough to look at it. The target's electromagnetic emissions can be analyzed for an indication of its status. Or its activity can give away who it belongs to. The observations in this last category are known as procedural indications. Each of these has pros and cons. So it usually takes a combination to get a good idea of the affiliation of the target, which is known as a positive identification, or PID for short. Visual identification, or VID, is going to be the most comprehensive. However, it has a pretty serious shortcoming in that you need to get close enough to a target to see it. This is typically less than two miles for unaided human eyesight. But a targeting pod with good resolution can see farther. Electromagnetic indications include systems like identification friend or foe transponders that can send a coded message to indicate a friend. We went into greater detail on how this works in this video. Another option is a special type of radar that does non-cooperative target recognition to identify the make and model of a radar contact. If the target is emitting signals, like from a scanning radar, then these signals can also be used to identify it. Lastly, we have procedural indicators. This simply means making an identification based on a target's activity. So if a plane took off from a known enemy airfield, we can make an ID based on its point of origin. Or if an unknown contact joins a formation of known hostile aircraft, then it is ID'd based on guilt by association. Friendly aircraft can be ID'd procedurally too. The overall Air Component Commander can set up procedures for all friendly aircraft to follow. So for example, when strike aircraft are crossing into enemy territory, certain routes can be identified as transit routes. There might even be specific altitude bands known as transit levels that everyone will use. Separate ingress and egress routes can also be put in place. These special procedures will be outlined in an airspace control order or ACO. This is a document that accompanies each day's air tasking order. As long as friendly aircraft stick to these routes, it makes it very clear to DCA fighter patrols if someone is friendly. When an unknown aircraft approaches from outside of these procedural areas, then they automatically know to keep an eye on it. The procedures used to conduct identification will be spelled out in the SPINs, or Special Instructions. Like the airspace control order, this also accompanies a daily air tasking order. Even though all these instructions are spelled out in the SPINs and ACO, there's always a chance that not everything goes as planned. A friendly aircraft with battle damage may need to fly directly to the nearest airfield instead of using an established transit route. Radio or IFF failures could prevent electromagnetic indicators from being used to make a PID. It's for these reasons that every area of responsibility will have its own rules of engagement. The exact details of the ROE are up to the Joint Forces Commander, and you can find out more about that command structure in this video. Fighter pilots and ground-based air defenses will need to be briefed on the ROE beforehand. Normally, the ROE takes the form of a matrix. This is going to look like a set of questions that need to be answered in a specific order to come up with an ID. The specific set of answers will lead to an identification in one of the following categories. Using all the available indicators, it should be possible to determine if a contact is a friend, a non-participating neutral, or one of the two enemy categories. The difference between the last two is going to be whether or not authorization has been given to fire on the contact. So they have two special brevity codes assigned to them, bandit and hostile. Once a contact has been PID'd as an enemy, it will be called a bandit, which is defined like this. Positively identified as an enemy in accordance with theater ID criteria. The term does not imply direction or authority to engage. As you can see, this is an enemy, but without authority being granted to shoot at it. This situation often arises when there is an adversarial relationship between nations, but neither side wants to start a war. There is still a need to categorize radar contacts even when they won't be shot at. But we can use the ROE matrix to answer further questions that will turn this bandit into a hostile. A hostile is a contact identified as enemy upon which clearance to fire is authorized in accordance with theater rules of engagement. 
When a contact can't be PID'd using electromagnetic or procedural means, it's going to be labeled as a bogey. This simply means it's unknown and needs further investigation. So how do we turn that bogey into a hostile that can be fired on? This is where the ROE matrix comes into play. This is something created by the JFAC, and if you want to know more about what a JFAC does, check out this video. Everyone in the theater will have the same ROE matrix, and it'll start with the brand new radar or data link track. It starts off with the question asking, does this contact have any friendly electromagnetic or procedural indicators? This is where you'll typically see IFF systems used to quickly identify a friend. If the answer to this question is yes, then it will be marked as friendly and sent out as a green circle on the data link network. We'll also move it out here to the do not shoot column. Now let's say the answer to that question is no. That doesn't necessarily make it an enemy. It could be an ally that doesn't have the correct IFF transponder set up. Now that track would fall into a category known as meeting lack of friendly criteria. At this point, we want to check for electromagnetic or procedural indicators of a neutral aircraft. This could very well be a humanitarian aid delivery or a non-aligned nation's aircraft accidentally straying into the combat area. Either way, neutral aircraft oftentimes will have a transponder running to let everyone know who they are. This would most likely be a Mode 3A transponder, which we covered in the video on how IFF works. They might also be flying in a published air route, which would be a procedural indicator of neutral status. In all cases, a visual ID would identify the aircraft. So a DCA patrol could be tasked with an intercept to VID a contact. In the event this contact meets neutral criteria, we would move it over to the Do Not Shoot column. Now what if we don't have neutral or friendly indicators? Things get a little more complicated. To be positively ID'd as an enemy, an aircraft cannot have any friendly or neutral indicators, and it has to have one of the following. Enemy electromagnetic or procedural indications, or BVID'd. You could get this from sources like the non-cooperative target recognition feature of a radar, or passive detection of emissions like receiving radar signals from a system that is only used by the enemy. There can be several kinds of procedural indications too like a point of origin at a known enemy airbase. Certain flight profiles can also indicate enemy activity. A contact flying at Mach 2 straight at your AWACS is going to be an interceptor, not a stray airliner. Something flying just above the treetops on its way towards a friendly tank column can also be a procedural indicator identified by the JFAC. But this will vary from one command to the next. Because of the risk of fratricide, we want to be very careful before authorizing a shot. For that, we need a positive indication that this is an enemy, and that can only happen with either an electromagnetic indication or a VID. Procedural indicators are not enough to be 100% sure. In other words, the best you can do here is a bandit ID, not a hostile ID that permits an engagement. Non-cooperative target recognition or a passive ID through a radar warning receiver could work in this case. But what happens when NCTR can't ID a target and it's not emitting signals? What if it's a scenario like the recent wars in Georgia and Ukraine where both sides fly the same model of aircraft? In those cases, you're not going to get a positive ID using electromagnetic means. That leaves a VID as the only option. Like I mentioned earlier, this will make things interesting. Once the determination has been made that this is not a friendly or a neutral aircraft, then the contact is marked as a bandit. However, there is a caveat. A bandit has not yet met the criteria to be fired upon so it's not ready to move into the shoot column just yet. This can happen for various reasons. One is that an enemy may be operating in an area where shooting at it is off limits. An example of this would be an adversary flying over international waters. Yes, they are the enemy, but neither side wants to start hostilities. Another example is when there's a possibility of the contact being a friendly. A damaged friendly aircraft may have lost its IFF and is taking the most direct route home. So on a radar screen, it's an aircraft without friendly electronic indicators flying in off-limits airspace. That can look like an enemy, but it isn't. Once you can answer the following questions, then you can turn the bandit into a hostile and move it into the shoot column. Can the contact be positively ID'd as an enemy? And does the ROE allow me to shoot? Now let's say after going through the entire list of questions, you still can't fit a contact into a category. In that case, it would be marked as a bogey. When you get here, it means all beyond visual range means of ID have failed. 
the only option left is an intercept for a VID, which is why intercepts are still so important even in the age of beyond visual range combat. One thing I want to point out here is that this is just one example of an ROE matrix. A real-world ROE matrix would be tailored for a specific operational area. Extra questions might be added if there are a lot of third parties involved, or restrictions might be lifted if the only aircraft in the area will be friendly fighters. Now let's take a look at how this might sound over the radio. In this scenario, a DCA patrol with the call sign of Hornet 1 is in contact with a controller named Chalice to make the following request. Chalice, Hornet 1, declare East Group. Hornet 1 is asking for the identity of the eastmost group in its lane. So Chalice electronically interrogates the East Group and gets no response from them. So the reply would go like this. Chalice, East Group, Bullseye 27327, 22,000, Track East, Bogey Spades. This last part, Bogey Spades, is Chalice saying that the interrogation was unsuccessful and so the affiliation is unknown. If they continue to watch this bogey, they might see some procedural indicators. The bogey might fly a course that complies with the safe passage procedures outlined in the airspace control order. In this case, it gets the label of Rider. There's also a brevity code for a bogey that is not conforming to safe passage procedures. That term is Gopher. But what if there are procedural indicators for an enemy? There are some brevity codes for those too. If the contact meets point of origin criteria, in other words, it has been tracked taking off from a known enemy airfield, then it would be labeled as an outlaw. And if it's passed through a defensive layer, like let's say another DCA flight's lane or a zone covered by a friendly air defense system, then it would be called a leaker. Here's how that would be communicated. Viper 1, leaker bullseye, 305, 65, 5000, track south, hostile two contacts. Here we see that our leaker group is flying at low level heading south. This group is two contacts, which is a good sign these are military aircraft since airliners don't typically fly in formation at low level. And they've been identified as hostile, which means Viper 1 was just given permission to fire on them. That's a lot that was communicated in one short message. So I hope these examples help to clear up how a modern air force would quickly and concisely identify aircraft. Doing this fast and accurately is key to gaining air supremacy. This also gives a modern air force the ability to fight at beyond visual ranges. Now you might have noticed that some of the examples I used contain the group. In the next video in this series, we'll go into how these groups are identified and how they're used to create a clear picture of the battle. I hope you'll come back to watch that one.